to get started. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Job chapter 1, if you will. Job chapter 1 will be our text for today. For those of y'all who are new, you're maybe visiting Believe Church today. We've been on a series now for a few weeks, uh, and it's simply entitled, Why? Okay? That is the title of our series, Why? Because it is our attempt to answer the universal or the cosmic question that we all have. And that universal or cosmic question that we all have is this. If God is real, if God is so good, then why is there so much bad? We have all asked that question before, and if you have not asked that question before, just keep living. <laughs> Just keep living. You live long enough, you will begin to ask that same question. God, if you are real, if you exist, if you are so good as the scriptures claim that you are, as we sing about, then please tell me, why is there so much bad? I can almost guarantee you there are some people in Rockport, some people in Aransas Pass, Port Aransas, Referio, Ingleside, Houston, who are asking God that very question this very day. God, where were you? God, if you are sovereign over all things, God, if you are in complete and total control over everything, including the weather, then please tell me how in the world could you allow this to happen? God, if you are so good, then why is there so much bad? That is the universal, that is the cosmic question that we all have. And so what we're doing is we're studying the book of Job. We're studying the book of Job in order to answer this cosmic question. <laughs> because that's what the book of Job does. Because Job is about to suffer. Job is about to go through a storm of his own. Job's life is about to crumble and crash before his eyes. And so, in so doing, we get to... See God answer this cosmic question because what God does is he takes us behind the scene. He takes us behind the curtain and sees why this is going to happen. And he's going to do that in a way of taking us to the making of Job's storm. See, there are different networks sometimes they will put on these special broadcasts where they will do the making of movies, right? We've all seen that. The making of Titanic. The making of Star Wars. And what they do is they will show you, uh, you get to see what is and how it came to be. So you will see the uh, blue screen, you will see the stuntmen, you will see the lines and the cables, you will see the actors, and you will see all of how it came together to produce the movie that you get to see on the big screen. It is the making of or the behind the scenes of your movie. Well, God does the same thing. God is going to give us a glimpse into the making of or the behind the scenes of Job's storm. And in so doing, we are going to be able to see our question answered. See, from our perspective, Job's storm does not make sense. From our perspective, Job's suffering does not make sense. As we said uh, last two weeks when we talked about Job, Job is described as being a, an upright man, a blameless man, one who fears God, who shuns evil. And so if anybody should have escaped the suffering of life, it should have been Job. But yet he is going to suffer like no one else has. But God is going to give us a glimpse to the making of his storm to behind the scenes that we may understand why that is. And he is going to do this, God is going to do this by inviting us into one of his staff meetings. You realize God has staff meetings? <laughs> Throughout scripture you will find different times when God calls a staff meeting. And like the old saying goes, I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall of God's staff meeting. Well, God gives you an opportunity to do that. Throughout Scripture, God has or holds these staff, and he lets us in on it. For example, you go to Genesis, the Bible says, 
heavens and the earth, the animals, the sea, the birds, the fish, all that. He then had a staff meeting. Because the Bible says, he goes and says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule. It was a staff meeting because the us that God was referring to was the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They all came together. They had a staff meeting. They said, okay, we've saved our most prized possession for last. Now that we've created all this, we are going to create humanity. We're going to create mankind, and we're going to create mankind so that they may rule what we have created. God let us in on that staff meeting. There's another staff meeting you will find in the book of Genesis. It's at the Tower of Babel. The Bible says the people were one, and so they began to uh, rebel against God. They built a city for themselves. They built a tower for themselves, and they uh, made a name for themselves. So God then holds another staff meeting. He says, look, the people are one, and now that they have done this, nothing that they pose to do will be withheld for them. So come. Let us go down there quickly and confuse their language so that they may be scattered all over the face of the world. God holds a staff meeting and he lets us in the staff meeting of what happened at the Tower of Babel. Well, in the book of Job, God is about to have another staff meeting. He's going to have another staff meeting, but the reason why this staff meeting is different is because it includes Satan. The staff meeting that God is about to have, that he is going to invite us into, is different because this staff meeting includes Satan himself. You see, you cannot even begin to talk about suffering without talking about Satan. I mean, after all, he was the originator of it then, and he is the instigator of it now. And so if we're going to have a series on suffering, if we're going to talk about all the suffering that Job is going to endure and go through, you cannot begin to talk about suffering without talking about Satan. See, many of us, I believe, we have a warped view of Satan. What we've been doing throughout this series is we've been talking about the fallacies we believe, the fallacies that lead to our frustration. And I believe some of those fallacies have to deal with Satan as well. There are many fallacies we believe about Satan. Either we give him too much credit, or we don't give him enough credit. Either we say things like, the devil made me do it, or let me go do it to the devil. Let me go give him a black eye. I mean, either it's one or the other. Either we're saying he's as powerful as God, or he's no one that I need to concern myself with. These are fallacies that we believe about Satan that lead to us being frustrated with life. And so because of that, because of these fallacies, today what I want to do is I want to give the devil his due. And I want to put him in his proper place that you may understand the correlation between Satan and our suffering. So this next installment in our series, Why? Answering the Causation, I've simply entitled it, Satan and Suffering. Okay? Satan and Suffering. In Job chapter 1, starting in verse 6, let us read together. Job 1, 6, it says this, Now there was a day when the sons of God, or angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. What do you have here is one of God's staff meetings. The Bible says he has called his angels to him to give a report to him. And among the rest of the sons of God, the angels of God, Satan is also called to this staff meeting. And he too is called to give a report. And so God asks him, Satan, where you been, what you been doing? Okay, now you got to know something about God, okay? Whenever God asks a question, 
He's not looking for information, okay? <laughs> we are talking about the all-knowing God, the God who is omniscient. He knows all things already. So throughout the Bible, anytime you hear of God a asking a question, he's not looking for information. <laughs> he goes, Adam, where are you? He knew exactly where Adam was. That's not why he's asking the question. Usually when God in a question, it is to lead into something. It is to set something up. And so when Satan comes to this staff meeting, he says, Satan, where have you been? And what have you been up to? Satan says, well, I have been walking to and fro, back and forth on earth. Okay, well, that's a little vague, Satan. What do you mean by that? Well, in order to know exactly what Satan's been up to, what he's been doing, you have to go to 1 Peter 5 a. 1 Peter 5 a will tell us this. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> so when Satan says, I've been walking to and fro on earth, walking back and forth on earth, what he's been doing is looking to see who he might devour. He's been looking to see what kind of havoc he can bring in somebody's life. He's been looking to see what kind of suffering, what kind of death, what kind of destruction he can bring upon the people of this earth. That's what he has been doing. So when God asks him, Satan, where you been, what you been doing, that's what he's doing. He's looking for someone to devour. So knowing that, that of course brings up some questions. You have some questions in your mind, and I believe the biggest question you have is this. If that is the case, if that's what Satan does, if he goes back and forth, to and fro, on the earth, seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he may destroy, seeking whom he may bring uh, havoc and suffering and death and destruction to, why in the world does he exist? Anybody ever had that question before? Why in the world does Satan even exist if that's what he's doing, if that's what he's up to? Or why does God even allow Satan to continue? Anybody will be honest and have, say you had that question before. <laughs> why does God allow Satan to do that? Why does he exist? Why is he allowed to continue if he is the cause of our pain and our suffering? And the fallacy is this. People believe, well, I guess God created Satan, sin, and evil. God created Satan, sin, and evil, and now he wants to come against it, including us, rather than just getting rid of it altogether. Why does he do that? And the line of thinking in this, the reason why people believe that God created Satan, sin, and evil is because they say this, well, God created all things. All things that exist were created by God. And so, since God created all that exists, and Satan's sin and evil exist, that means God created Satan's sin and evil, right? Wrong. Wrong. God did not create Satan. He did not create sin, and he certainly did not create evil. You have to understand what evil is. Evil is not the opposite of God. Okay, remember, God has no opposites. Nothing that is opposite that could be compared to God. Evil is not the opposite of God. Evil is the absence of God. Evil is the lack of God. The less of God you have, the more of evil will show up. That's what evil is. It's kind of like when we uh, take the temperature. When we say, wow, it's 30 degrees outside. It's cold. Well, the 30 degrees isn't talking about how cold it is. The 30 degrees is referring to how much heat is out there. We don't measure how cold something is. We measure how much heat something has. Because the less heat you have, the more cold you will have. Same thing with light. We don't measure how dark something is. We measure how much light something has. Because the absence of light is darkness. The reason why a black hole is a black hole is because of the absence.
absence of light. Well, in the same way, evil exists when there is an absence of God. When there is a lack of God, evil shows up. So no, God did not create. He did not create Satan. He did not create sin. Okay, well you say, well, why do they exist then? If God didn't create evil, if he didn't create Satan, if he didn't create sin, why do they exist? Well, because what he created, the potential for it. What God created was the potential for Satan. The potential for sin. The potential for for evil. Well, how did he do that? With free will. That's what he did. When God decided to create humanity with free will, the ability to choose, he created the potential for evil. The potential for sin. Because while he created us to choose him, he also created us with the opportunity not to choose him. Why? Because he wanted love to be genuine. You know, we have a lot of advances in artificial intelligence now, right? A lot of advances in artificial intelligence. So you have things like Siri. You have Alexa now. <laughs> and the report is they have people who are actually falling in love with Siri and Alexa. Y'all know that? <laughs> people are having these relationships with artificial intelligence. Because you could have these full-on engagements, these full-on conversations with Alexa. <laughs> I mean, they'll talk back to you. You'll get in conversation with them. And so people have begun to fall in love with these devices, with this artificial intelligence. They've made movies about it. They've had documentaries on it. That's what people are doing now. But listen, no matter how much you love Siri, no matter how much you love Alexa, they can never love you back. Okay? Oh, they can tell you they love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, I want you. Oh, I'm so glad to have you in my life. They can say that, but you know it's not real. Why? Because you know they've been programmed to do that. They have been programmed to say that. They have been programmed to respond that way. Well, God didn't want a Siri or Alexa relationship with us. He did not program us to love him. What he did was he gave us choice to love him. What he did was he gave us free will to love him. And by doing that, I have the choice to love God, but I also have the choice to reject God. And so by God creating us this way, by God creating us with free will, by God creating us with choice, he created the potential for evil. He created the potential for sin. He created the potential for Satan. Because just like we can choose to love God, we can choose to reject God. We can choose to walk away from God. We can choose to rebel from God. And the less God you have, the more evil will then show up. So no, God did not create Satan, but he did create the potential for him. Because the ability to choose, being created with free will, this is not just for humanity. God created his holy angels with the same ability. God created his holy angels with the same free will ability, the same ability to choose as he gave humanity. How do we know that? Well, because Lucifer chose. Lucifer chose to rebel against God. Not only did Lucifer chose, uh, choose to rebel against God, but the Bible says a third of God's own angels chose to follow Lucifer. So that lets us know that God created angels with the same ability to choose. The same free will that he gave humanity because Lucifer and a third of God's angels chose to rebel against God. So what I want to do today is I want to take a closer look at the making of this monster. Okay? I want to take you behind the scenes. I want to take you to the making of this monster where we will see that, no, God did not create Satan. God did not create Satan, and we're going to see that in the making of this monster. In Ezekiel 28, you still have your Bibles open. Go with me to Ezekiel 28, 
Starting in verse 11, what this is called or referred to, this is called a dual prophecy, okay? This is called a dual prophecy where God is going to address a man, but he's actually going to be speaking to the spirit behind the man. In this case, Satan or Lucifer, okay? This is a dual prophecy. Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 11, notice what it says. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. Here it is. God is going to describe the being he created. Thus says the Lord God. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. When God created this being called Lucifer, he pulled out every stop. He spared no expense. He took all that he had and he just unleashed it onto Lucifer when he created him. He says, you were created in perfection. You were created in wisdom. You were created in beauty. That's how I created you, Lucifer. He says, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So right there, we see two things. One, Lucifer is a created being. Okay? God is eternal, which he has always been. He is also everlasting, which means he always will be. That is not the case for Satan. That is not the case for Lucifer. No, there was a time, even probably before time, when Lucifer was not. There was a day when he was actually created. God, there's never been a time when he wasn't, okay? But secondly, we see why he was created. The Bible says when he was created, he was given timbrels and pipes. Many scholars believe that's because it was Lucifer's job to lead worship in heaven. Okay? Lucifer was the worship leader of heaven. So you have archangels in heaven. So while you have Michael, the archangel who is over war, and Gabriel, the archangel over work, Lucifer, the archangel, was over worship. He was the one to usher the praise and the worship to God. That's what he was created to do. So God says the workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. That's another way we know it's talking about Lucifer because a cherub is an angel. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. This is talking about the, the access that Lucifer had to God himself. But then it continues. Here it is. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. That is, till iniquity was found in you. Okay, now wait a minute. God, you said Lucifer was created in perfection. If Lucifer was created in perfection, how can there be iniquity found in him? Simple, free will. <laughs> Choice, that's how. Because even though Lucifer was created in perfection, in beauty, in wisdom, he was also created with free will. He was also created with the ability to choose. And the day came where he chose to rebel against God. He continues and says this, by the abundance of your trading, he got all of God's angels or a third of God's angels to follow him. You became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. We see the problem that Lucifer had was the problem we all have and that is pride. Thinking more of yourself than you ought. Some preacher says, Lucifer looked in the mirror one day and he lost his mind. I am too good. I'm too beautiful. I'm, I'm too uh, awesome for me to be ushering worship and praise to God. Worship and praise ought to be coming to me. He 
thought he should have re been receiving that rather than taking it to the Lord. And so because of his beauty, the Bible says he was lifted up or got the big head. He said, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, how you were created. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. This is a prophecy about Lucifer and how he became Satan. God did not create Satan. What he created was the potential for Satan. No, he created Lucifer. He created the shining one. He created a being who was perfect in beauty and wonder and splendor and wisdom. That's what he created. But because he also created him with free will, Lucer then created Satan. So God gives the beginning, the middle, and the end of Lucifer. How he became Satan and what will eventually become of him. And if you want to know specifically what exactly Lucifer did to become Satan, go to Isaiah 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, God gives us specifically what Lucifer did to become Satan. Isaiah 14, 12 says this. Oh, how you are fallen from heaven, O oh Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Here it is. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north where God sits. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what he said. That's what he set out to do. That was the choice or the decision that he made. Lucifer wanted to be God. Lucifer was tired of ushering the worship and the praise to God. He wanted the worship and the praise to come to him. So he says, forget this. I'm about to ascend above God. I'm about to sit on the throne of God. I am about to be like the Most High. He made the choice. He made the decision to come against God himself. Because he wanted to be God. So no, God did not create Satan. He created the potential for Satan. What he created was Lucifer. And Lucifer chose to become Satan or the adversary of God. Okay, were well you saying, well, that may be true, Pastor. God may not have created Satan. But he certainly could destroy him. I mean, all he has to do is speak a word and Satan would be no more. With just a flick of his finger, he can fling Satan out of this universe and he would be no more. Why didn't God do that? If God didn't create him, that's, that's fine. I can accept that. But he could at least now destroy him so that he won't be any longer able to walk to and fro on the earth seeking whom he may devour. So why didn't God do that? Well, you have to keep in mind that even though he is the devil, he's also God's devil. Okay? He belongs to God. That's why he has to show up at this staff meeting. That's why he has to give a report and answer to God because even though he's the devil, he's still God's devil. He still belongs to God. See, we get this, this misconception about this in our head, this another fallacy. We think God is in heaven and Satan is in hell. God has his control center in heaven controlling things. Satan has his control center in hell controlling things. And the two never have any interaction together. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. 
I mean, we just got through reading that that's wrong. <laughs> because Satan shows up at the staff meeting. So we know that's not the case. God is sovereign or in complete and total control over everything and everybody, including Satan, including the demons. Everything and everybody is under the power and the control of God. So if God is keeping Satan around, there must be a purpose for him. <laughs> if God is keeping Satan around, there must be a purpose for him. So here's the question. Does God even use Satan? That's the question. Now, put your seatbelts on because I'm about to mess up your theology here, okay? <laughs> here's the question. Does God even use Satan? Some people say, well, no way. God has nothing to do with Satan. God has nothing to do with Satan. God doesn't use Satan. Well, Go with me to James chapter 1 so you will see the reason behind God having to use even Satan. In James 1.13, the Bible says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Okay? When you are tempted in this life, when you are tempted in this world, as I, we can never say God is the one tempting me. Don't ever say that. Why? He says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone that is with evil. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor can he tempt anyone with evil. And so what God does is he allows Satan to do what he can't do. Okay? That's what God does. He allows Satan to do what he can do. You know, we have this, this notion, we say, we even sing it, that there's nothing God can do or can't do. Well, that's just not true. There's some things that God can do. Number one, he can't fail. We know that. But no, number two, he can't sin. He can't lie. He, there's no evil or iniquity in him. So because God cannot tip anyone with evil, what he does is he allows Satan to do what he can do. Now, I know what y'all thinking, Pastor, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, obviously, I've come prepared, so go with me to 1 Kings 22, okay? 1 Kings 22, we're going to see how God employs even Satan. In 1 Kings 22, it is the story of the demise of King Ahab. Ahab was one of the kings of Israel, and he was the worst king Israel ever had. He was evil to the core. He led Israel to uh, go in rebellion against God, to practice idolatry. He was the one who married Jezebel, who killed all the prophets of God. And so Ahab has become wicked, corrupt, so God is about to remove the kingdom and Ahab from him. Okay? And so in 1 Kings 22, God is going to have another staff meeting. God is going to have another staff meeting, and he's going to invite us into this staff meeting. Now watch it. 1 Kings 22, starting in verse 20. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? See, what a king would do before he would go into war, he would go to his prophets. And he says, What is the word of the Lord? Will I prevail at this battle? Will I be victorious? Or will I fall? And the prophets, they would pray, they would hear from the Lord, and they would say, the Lord is saying, no, don't go up, you will not prevail. Or, yes, go up, for the Lord has surely given them into your hands. And so God has this staff meeting, and he's saying, okay, who is going to persuade Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead that he may fall in battle? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. That's what you do at a meeting, right? So he's, it's a staff meeting, <laughs> One spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, well, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. <laughs> so this lying spirit comes up and says, God, you need somebody to persuade Ahab to go to war? 
I'll do it. God says, how are you going to do it? I'm going to be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. What did God say? Lying spirit, how did you get in this meeting? Is that, is that what he said here? <laughs> how did you get in our staff meeting? That's not what he said. Look what, what God says. And so he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. God employed a lying spirit to fulfill his purpose. Okay, well you say, well that's one example of God using the devil or God using a lying spirit to fulfill his purpose. Give me another. Well, not only does God do this with the enemies of God, he also does it with the friends of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, God is going to do it with Paul. Paul, if you remember, was the one who was taken to the third heaven, who was shown and revealed things he said was unlawful for him to even talk about on this side of glory. And because of all of this revelation, because of all of this enlightenment uh, that God gave in Paul, God understood that it would have been very easy for Paul to get the big head. For Paul to be stuck on himself, for Paul to fall in the same trap that Lucifer fell in. So Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12. And lest I should be exalted above measure, the big head, by the abundance of the revelations God has given me, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now we can debate all day long, go back and forth on what this thorn was. Everybody wants to debate about what this thorn was, and we can debate all day long because the Bible never tells us what this thorn actually was. But it does tell us who it came from. The Bible says, since of the revelations God had given me, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of who? Talk to me, a messenger of who? Satan. A messenger of Satan. God allowed a thorn to be placed in the flesh of Paul to keep him grounded, to keep him humble. And he says it was a messenger of Satan that brought about that thorn. Why? Because God employed Satan to do his will, his purpose. He said, lest I be exalted above measure, God allowed a messenger of Satan to come to me to keep me humble and to keep me grounded. Well, let me give you one more so you can see that God still employs even Satan. Even at the very end, in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 1, to give you some eschatology here. In Revelation 21, it says this, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So God says at the last, in the last days, an angel is going to come down having a chain. He is going to grab Satan, Lucifer, the devil, whatever you want to call him, and he is going to chain him up, bind him. He is going to then throw him into the bottomless pit. He is then going to shut the door on that bottomless pit, seal it, and lock him there for a thousand years so that he cannot any longer walk to and fro on earth deceiving or seeking whom he may devour. He will not be able to do that for a thousand years. But this is what gets me. It says, but after these things, after the thousand years, he must be released for a little while. Now, wait a minute, God. <laughs> you have him where you want him. He is chained. He is thrown in the bottomless pit. The seal is closed on him. He is there. You have him where you want him. Why in the world will you... Let him out again. Why in the world will you open up the seal, take off the chain, let him loose again? Why in the world will you do that? Because there's still a purpose for him. That's why. There is still a purpose for Satan. That's why. 
You see, the purpose of Satan is simple. The purpose of Satan is this, to bring out what's in. That's Satan's purpose. See, I know you think Satan is your problem. Satan is not your problem. Satan is not your problem. The sin within is your problem. Okay? That's your problem. All Satan does is bring that out. <laughs> That's all he does. All Satan does is bring that sin that is within you out. He causes you to manifest that sin that's within you. So no, Satan is not your problem. Sin is your problem. And what Satan does is he brings out the wrong that's within. So you may be thinking, why in the world is God going to let him free, let him loose at the end of these thousand years? Well, this is why. Because in the thousand years, in the millennial reign of Christ, you're going to have people born in this millennial kingdom, millennial reign. And they will be born with the same sinful fallen bodies you and I have right now. And just like we have to choose to serve God, to worship God, to love God, they are also going to have to choose. You say, well, wait a minute. Why in the world would anyone not choose that? I mean, Jesus Christ is going to be here. He's going to sit on the throne of his father David. Why in the world would anybody not choose him? Well, ask Adam and Eve. They had the same setup. Ask Lucifer. He had the same setup in the very presence of God, but yet they both chose to rebel against him. So in the same way, during this millennial reign of Christ, these thousand years, when the children are born into this kingdom, they are going to have to choose whether or not to believe in the God that they can even see before them. And many will choose, not because they want to, but because they have no choice but to. The Bible says in that time, God is going to rule, Jesus Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron. That means that anybody sins, anybody rebels, it will be judged swiftly and quickly. And so people will figure it out very quickly. If I sin and rebel, the hammer's coming down. <laughs> so you're going to have millions of people who are doing the right thing, not because they want to, but because they feel they have no choice but to. So what Satan is going to do when he is released, he is going to bring the rebellion out of them. He's going to come to them, and the Bible says he's going to be able to convince a whole multitude of people to once again rebel against God they can actually see. And they're going to come to war against God. So his final purpose, Satan's final purpose, is simply to bring out the rebellion in these people. That's what his purpose is. So what his purpose is then is his purpose now. That's why God just doesn't flick him out of the universe. That's why God just doesn't destroy him. Because even though he's the devil, he still belongs to God. And God has purpose for him as well. And that is to bring out what's in not only does Satan bring out the wrong that's in us, though, as we're going to discover with Job, he will also bring out what's right in us. That's another purpose of Satan, and that's where we're going to go to next week. We're done now, and I know this is a lot, but you need to understand this before we get into the suffering of Job, okay? You need to understand this. Because you're going to go through the book of Job and you're going to have all these questions and wonder why and what's going on and why did God just uh, sick Satan on Job? And, and all. You're going to have all these questions. So you have to know and understand the backdrop, the history, the behind the scenes, the making of, so that you may better understand not only what Job is about to go through, but why Job is about to go through it. When God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it, he created them good and perfect. That's why he said it. After every day, he said, and the Lord created this, and he says, and it was good. Everything that God created was good. Everything that God created was perfect, including Adam and Eve and including Lucifer. It was good and it was perfect. But because he created them with free will, he also created them with the potential for evil. And so that's why evil exists. In Satan, 
in this world and in us, it is because God created the potential for us not to choose him. And so, as we continue in this series, we're done now, but as we continue in this series, we're going to see that suffering is ultimately the result of Satan and sin. Even if it's for our good, even if it's for our growth and development, God is trying to get us from being ruled and controlled by Satan and by our flesh and ruled by his spirit. But ultimately, suffering is a result of Satan and sin. But our victory, what God wants you to know today, is our victory, our victory over suffering is the result of the Savior's victory over Satan and sin. And that's why the Bible says, greater is he in me than he in the world. <laughs> even though Satan is out there, even though he's running to and fro on earth, seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says, but greater is he in me than he that is in the world.